Uh, welcome to live from FDIC. This is the Command Show with Chief Castros and Brian Brush. Hi, Brian Brush. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm mean, very blessed this morning. It could not be better. Before we get underway, would you mind if I mention our sponsor today? I would love it. Okay. Our sponsor for this podcast is Firehouse Subs. Man, that's good some good stuff. Love me some Firehouse Subs. <laughs> uh, Firehouse Subs, uh, not just the restaurant, but the Public Safety Foundation. Uh, if you enjoy more subs, you will uh, save more lives. Uh, they they take a lot of donations for fire service grants uh, through their restaurants, and it is just an awesome program. Yeah. Uh, you can also find out more about restaurant ownership. They're really trying to support firefighters owning the restaurants uh, at uh, firehousesubs.com. So firehouse franchise firehouse subs franchising dot com. I think it's awesome. I mean, I, whenever I go into a firehouse subs, I almost feel like I'm in a firehouse. I know I'm supporting uh, our brothers and sisters and um, it's entrepreneurial. It's something you can do uh, if you have a franchise with your friends, maybe a whole firehouse together, put it together and have a franchise and work on it on your days off, rotate or whatever. But what an awesome, uh, what an awesome enterprise. So yeah. I'm proud of you, Firehouse Subs. Thank <laughs> and, you. And it's got and such great a, sandwiches. Yeah. And it's got such a local feel. It's pretty cool to go into them and they'll have yeah. that that city's yeah. gear on the wall, that yep. city's helmet, that city's rigs. It, yeah. it, they, they do it right. Yeah, pictures yeah. on the wall. It's fantastic. Love it. Even in airports, I'll walk through an airport and I want to just go in there and hang out for a minute and have a sandwich. It's great. Well, buddy, um, it's been a, an amazing week already. Yeah. Um, we, we both got here on Sunday and uh, we, we both got to teach classes yesterday. Um, I got to lead off the show with a workshop in the morning and, and I, I love the workshop format. It's yeah. something that I, I've not taught in before, but to have a, a smaller room, to have more time with the students. Um, I think I'm hooked. I definitely will be putting in for yeah. more workshops uh, in the future. It was a, is a great way to uh, truly communicate some of our programs and, and get guys experience actually doing it uh, hands on in, in the class. I mean, it's incident command, so it's a different type of yeah. hands on. Yeah. But uh, uh, you want to talk at all about how yesterday went? Yesterday was amazing. We uh, <laughs> like Brian said, we had two classes, two workshops, three conference workshops. It was Monday. His was in the morning from uh, 8 to noon. Mine was from 1.30 to 5.30. And we kind of built off each other. Um, we really had an opportunity to um, teach together, but not teach together in the sense that Brian kicked it off and I sat in the back of his class. I did the afternoon and he sat in the back of mine. But the message was the same. It was just from two different angles and approaches. And the, the, the core uh, of this message this week is our new book, uh, Mastering Fireground Command, Calm the Chaos, the textbook. And it is uh, a labor of love. It's out. Uh, please get one. Uh, order one. They're going like hotcakes. Um, we expect to sell out this week. So there's always already a second printing coming uh, that's been ordered. And uh, it's a labor of love. And people asked me, I think they asked you too, how long did it take you to yeah, write this thing? Yeah. And there's a couple of different answers. Yeah, I mean, uh, for this manuscript you know this this actual document it's uh it's been about two years and uh stretching back to uh one of our mentors and supporters uh bobby halton who uh who really kind of uh you know we brought him an idea we, we talked about the, the need that we saw for it in the fire service and then he challenged us to to make it a, a textbook specifically yeah. and uh that's that's a little out of uh the range of what we normally write we're both uh kind of narrative type writers we're we write articles and, and, and we present classes. So this was a, a push beyond our comfort level, even though he, we teach his command. I, I, I'm obviously a training chief to, to do the technical writing uh, was a challenge, but um, I think what you're trying to get at is the second answer is there's, there's over a thousand years of experience in this book and, yeah. and it's so well beyond us. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I enjoy out of this text more than anything, reading those contributing author pieces and, and yeah. those come from not two years of writing, but, uh, decades of command experience. Absolutely. You know, um, from a personal standpoint, it's been since 2005, probably two th since the year 2000, I'd say. That's when I became a captain. Um, and then I, I went to New York on 9 11. On, on the 11th, we deployed uh, Task Force 7, California, Sacramento. And we were there on the pile for 11 days. <clears throat> and then um, came back and was uh, part of the USAR program for many years. That's an element of, of command experience, uh, especially large incident management. Um, having grown up in California, started my career in 1987, went on a lot of strike teams, uh, both as a firefighter, as a, as a captain, and was on incident management team for four years, which took me across the country uh, at the strategic level. And so 
that was a foundation. But where I really feel like I cut my teeth was as a battalion chief for 13 years in a busy system. Um, but, but the spark that started this whole thing was in 2006. I was a one-year battalion chief, and I had a triple fatal fire, and it was terrible. And it's in the book. It, it's in the preface. Um, that triple fatal fire knocked me on my butt. It knocked all of us on our butts that were on that fire, all my, all my crews, all my officers. Um, it was terrible. Two little kids and their dad died in the apartment fire. And boring me from that day to this day, and, and, and as long as I live, probably will be a passion to help others learn from, from my mistakes and my triumphs and successes and lessons because we entered into a, a cauldron of, of learning, a cauldron of, of experience, and training and experience, uh, experimenting with new uh, untried techniques. We were bringing new tactics to the fire department. We were bringing new types of use of uh, the incident command system, uh, types of training for officer development. Uh, we built a command training center. We developed SOGs. We were doing multi-company drills. It was nothing, with, no stone was left unturned. And <clears throat> it led to the video series in 2011 from fire engineering. Um, and then the, the online course and now, and the train the trainer course, which is nationwide. Now we've gone all over the country teaching it. Um, but this book is the culmination of all that. It's the culmination of Brian's work. And like he said, there's a thousand years of experience in this book because we asked 32 of our friends to, to contribute what we're calling case studies in command or wisdom from the masters. Um, these are incredible pieces that, um, specific case studies and specific incidents around the nation. Um, if it was a significant incident and happened yeah. in the past five years, it's in this book. Yeah. Um, and that was incredibly humbling to have them join us in this endeavor. And this is not an East Coast or West Coast book, um, which, you know, there's kind of the East Coast, West Coast look at things. Typically at the IC, we talk East Coast, West Coast, left coast, right coast. I'll talk to Anthony Avillo. We'll give each other a bad time, you know. Uh, he says, yeah, you, you command from the car. You come, why don't you teach your classes from the lobby? And I give him a bad time. Yeah, you command your fires from the, from the living room, and you, know, you should have a piece of pizza and a yeah. slice of pie and a cigar. But this book, um, if you just look at the cover, there's L.A. City Fire Department and FDNY, both on the same cover. It's a nationwide, uh, it's a nationwide uh, book, and it's a thick book. It's 560 <laughs> pages. And um, I want to thank Brian because he – is the one who called me up one day and said, we need to write, or he said, you need to write a book. <laughs> yes, yeah, let's yes, yes. I, you, I was pointing fingers. You, you, this you, is what you need to do. Yeah, you need <laughs> to write a book. I think you should write a book. I'm like, well, I think you're a jerk. So I said, okay, I'll think about it. I said, number one, I've written two books. This is my third book, and I know what it takes to write a book. My wife knows what it takes to write a book. I said, so two caveats. One, you have to help me write a book. You have to convince have, Cynthia that we need it. You have to convince <laughs> Cynthia that we're going to do this. And that was the hard part. Yes, it was. Yeah. Right? That was probably harder than writing the book. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've, uh, am was more uncomfortable speaking to your wife than I've ever been on any other fire scene. So, but <laughs> yeah, it was, it was important. And I, you know, I think, I think you're kind of hitting on something and I, I certainly uh, spoke to it yesterday. The, uh, this is an East coast or West coast or, or a brand core, uh, concepts of, of incident command systems, core principles of, of the national incident management system are, are extremely valuable. And, uh, and, you know, speaking to your deployment on 9-11, we, we are a, a, a generation of firefighters that were pre and post 9-11 and we experienced NIMS and, and all that in-depth training on command and structure. And um, that was imprinted on us at a, at a very kind of influential time in our life. Um, and it, it's been, I guess, kind of lacking for a while. So but not to say that, that this replaces anything, um, not to say that it, uh, it, it is a substitute for anything or that it is a product. It's just re, uh, introducing folks to the incident command system, to, to good incident management, those, those core principles, um, that, that are broadly applied and, and especially important in a time where we are, um, under a whole new operational tempo. And yes, I think that that's, that's uh, yeah. that that's what that's kind of the beauty of it is 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 uh I mean I I know you put a lot of time and effort into your incident command practices and and redeveloping things at SAC Metro and uh, as a testament to that I mean I I want to encourage people what what he did in his system and his application uh, through the 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 safe consistent operations uh, SOPs SOGs incident command training multi company the things that you outline as far as your system for success. 
not just operationally, but culturally, um, they can be applied to any organization. And that, yeah, that was yeah. what I spent That's uh, yesterday morning just, just telling people is that he, he outlined the path. He, he demonstrated that it can be done. And in, in five years, it, it also applied to my organization. And, and it's just a, it's a roadmap to success in your operations and, and hopefully your outcomes, you know, and, and, and making, key, making yeah. rescues. And that is, that is uh, our core belief. And uh, I just could not be excited, more excited about the book and, yeah. and to be able to contribute to it. And I, yeah. I say it's my perspective is not from command. My perspective is from a organizational mindset of, of how do we institutionalize these concepts? And it, it takes a textbook to do that. So it does. And that, that's what kind of, <laughs> if you will, sold me on the idea of, of taking on this project was Brian's like, look, the video series is, is great and everything, but no one's going to use that to change culture. They're not going to use that to create promotional tests. They're not going to use that to, uh, to reference SOGs. Colleges aren't going to use it as a source. And I'm like, you know what, you got a point there. And so to that, this textbook is, is FESHI, NIMS, ICS, um, NFPA compliant. It's also Firescope compliant, which is which is really um, important that it's, again, we, it's a blending of a lot of experience, my own experience, Brian's experience, our research and study, firefighter rescue survey, mm -hmm. uh, FSRI, but also uh, a lot, 32 other colleagues and their experiences um, in, the, in the form of their case studies. And so it's a body of work that we think captures not only where we are in the, the in command as a, as a nation in North America, but where we've been and where we're going <clears throat> because there's a whole chapter on the history of incident command that Brian wrote, which was fascinating. I learned a lot just reading that. It's awesome to understand how we got to where we are. But the best part of the book, I think, yeah, is that it's so practical and useful for any fire department. We have had, we've trained to this curriculum for, for over a decade across the entire country. We've had departments as large as Oklahoma City to, tra to train the trainer. We've had departments as small as a volunteer department in Seguin, Texas, with two stations that are volunteers in a rural area. And it works for everybody because it's not a one-size-fits-all. Yeah, It's a buffet. And that's how the incident command system works. But it's not just about ICS. It's about strategy and tactics. We dive into tactical decision-making, yeah. life-saving tactics for everything from single-family dwellings to duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Um, multifamilies, apartments, garden style, center hall, taxpayers, commercials, big box, strip malls, high rises. And then we also jump into the all risk arena yeah. with vegetation fires and hazmat and high rise, obviously, but also MCIs and unified yeah. command. So it's a, it's, it's everything from a room and content yeah. to nine 11. And it's, it's just a, um, something we're proud of. And I think, uh, it's selling like hotcakes. And I think that if you buy it and your department institutes this kind of training, you'll be saving more lives, but doing it in a smart way without unnecessary risk. Yeah. So we want aggressive incident command. We want aggressive tactics and strategy. We don't want to be stupid about it. We want to be smart about it and not take unnecessary risk. So that's the key. Well, I would, I mean, well, I have this, I'll, I'll just tell you, I mean, and I, I think it's in, important to just clarify what you just spoke to and that's, you know, the, the, the term aggressive and the mindset that we mean by aggressive. And there is a chapter in here, chapter six, it's, it's aggressive command and tactics for life. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, the definition of aggressive that, that we use, I, I think it's important to, uh, to clarify here where the term aggressive was once deeply connected to recklessness. Today, it was more closely associated with the anticipation and planning, assertive, anticipation and planning assertive decisions and proactive actions. This is how we stay ahead of the incident power curve. So it is, it is very much aggressive in your, in your mindset. Education helps with the anticipation and proper positioning at the tactical level through a deeper understanding of the dynamics of our environment. Yep. I mean, that, that is a, that, again, like we talked about yesterday, professionalism has nothing to do with the paycheck. It is how yeah. you approach your job, uh, how you are educated and, and, and the, the, presence you 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 command yeah. with that and it's so uh, being aggressive is is that um what's going to come next how am i prepared for it it is it is anticipation through education and, and that's that's what we're after so. yeah it's all about being proactive um brian mentioned the incident power curve and that was something i i came up with based on my experience that an incident has kind of a, a predictable sequence you get on scene 
and everything's going crazy. Everyone's putting stretching lines, getting water supplies, initiating search, forcing entry. Companies are asking for assignments, and you have this spike of activity. And then there's a an initial uh, plateau, and you think, hey, things are going better. We're getting a knockdown. We got that supply. People stash. are working. Yeah. yeah, people are working. I can see conversion. Then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, we're we're doing good. Then there's this is like a false plateau because there's almost almost always a secondary spike. Yeah, fires in the attic. Fires in the attic. Victim. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Something comes up. Um, and those maydays, those victims, those exposures, they're almost always happen. It, it, the fire could just start to crank up again because the crews are fatigued. It's a hot day. Um, anticipating that is an example of staying ahead of the incident power curve and putting things in place like tactical supervisors. We talk a lot about the tactical gap. Yeah. That's another principle in this book that, that we created where <clears throat> there's a gap between the incident commander and the crews working at the task level. And that gap, it doesn't matter if you're across the street or on the, on the front sidewalk of a structure yeah. fire trying to command it. You don't know where everybody is truly. There's communication problems. There's freelancing. There's accountability issues. You don't really know what the conditions are in the rear. Um, and the crews may not even know because they're fighting fire and they can't see their hand in front of their face. Mm -hmm. And so the tactical gap is, is where reality is. That's where the NIOSH 5 live. And that's where... Um, the battle is really won or lost is in the tactical space. And, and we're, t we're kind of in this book kind of, I don't want to say attacks, but really emphasize the importance of the tactical space, tactical decision-making, timeliness. So we factor in data. And that's what, what's so great about work with Brian for me personally is he's great at taking data and information and analytics and putting it into practical use. Cause he's a, he's a fire ground commander. He's a training officer, but he goes to a lot of fires. And so what I love about that is that firefighter rescue survey, for example, which is he's part of that from the inception, that data is amazing. We're talking about roughly 4,000 civilian rescues now. And that's part of this information, part of this training. What is the best rescue tactics? When, when should we rescue somebody? Well, within about six to eight minutes of arrival. That, that's information that's critical to the incident commander and to the entire response and i think that that's you know that that's what we're just scratching the surface on in, in a lot of things and even i mean ulf sri and just an absolute incredible resource you know and, and if you look in our textbook we we reference specifically the ulf sri tactical considerations yep. you know and, and that's that's extremely <laughs> valuable and, and especially for guys like us or you know who have experience in the field um and and have humility we're willing to reference these tactical considerations and go yes that reinforces what i what i experienced um but there's other things it's like you know what that that counters my experience and i have to be open to understanding uh, what this means um i mean you and i had a, an extensive conversation um over the attic fire chapter yeah, you know and yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. i i told you i said chief i we we have to uh, we have to provide all perspectives on this, yeah. and I and I know your experience is X, um, but but this this information is presenting uh, theory Y, and and we need to include it in the book yeah, because yeah. it it is as valuable as your experience is. Their their data has equal weight, yeah. especially in the modern fire service. Yeah. And I was able to bring in um, you know some pictures, and again it's. How many pictures were in this book? Like almost 200, you know, oh, way more. Than yeah. That. Incident pictures, way more, a lot of ton of pictures, sequ sequential incident pictures of, of how we yeah. handled an attic fire yeah. uh, in, in, in complete alignment with the ULF SRI study. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's powerful, you know, yeah. bec because we're not to dismiss your experience, you communicate it, but also, Hey, look at it from this other angle. And, and here's the information that supports that. And that's why some people may be applying this. Yeah. Remember it's ULF SRI, NFPA. They're not, legal mandates their 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 considerations and recommendations for best practices and i, I mean i'm I, i'm very excited about how that all turned out yeah you know <clears throat> as an old salt i guess i'm a, i don't know if i should call myself that but i'm i'm 55 years old now i've been retired five years i've been active uh <clears throat> the entire time teaching around the country we have an awesome team of instructors so it's not just experience in the field i was a line battalion chief like i mentioned for 13 years it wasn't just that it's going around the country and learning from all these different fire departments. What are their experiences? What are their fires? How are they implementing their tactics and their command models? Um, it's getting all this data and all these stories um, and case studies from all of our friends across the country. Mike Dugan. How you doing, Cap? Good to see you, brother. <clears throat> and so that really, we wanted to have a blending of, of the science, if you will, or the data and experience. We want to have a blending. That's why the book is so thick, is that it covers everything. There's really no stone unturned. 
because in the modern era, you have to have great experience. You have to share it. You have to learn from it. You have to train. You have to do good after action reviews. You have to speak truth about what happened, what's working. Yeah. But you also have to look at the data and the science, what other people are doing with the, and what systems are provided, what firefighter rescue survey is saying, what ULSFR or FSRI is saying and blend it and, and be an educated incident commander. But it's not about the individual. This is, a, this is about team command, really. Yeah. And we call it, it's called mission command. And that's the article this month that yeah. we talked about. So, and, uh, well, what, why don't, I mean, why don't we get into that? I think, okay. I think that's, uh, uh, <laughs> so it, in the April issue and in, in, in our, our plan for, um, our podcast going forward, um, is to start to present more of the uh, more of the content within the textbook. We know that not everybody can uh, can can pay for the book. We know that not everybody's accessing the book, but um, these are our, our core principles as we talked about. They're not proprietary, and, and we want to share these concepts. Be it the history of command, be it uh, the the uh, aggressive command uh, and tactics for life. Um, all the way up to the high rise chapter and, and applying ICS to these incidents. We're not we're not telling you what hose lines to pull or anything, but we we have to be proactive in the deployment of division and group supervisors in these situations. Um, all the way just to, to an apartment fire, and that's driven by NFPA. But um, we can't be successful with our division and group supervisors without providing them training. But even more so, uh, <coughs> without starting with the leader's intent and, and what our goal is in, in that mission first mindset. And uh, that's really what um, what I'm excited to, yeah. to do is that the first article that, that we connect to this textbook is mission command and, yeah. and, and how we are moving. You know, people talk about, well, if command and control is bad, then what's the solution? It's like oh, command and control is, is not necessarily bad. It's, it's a model that we've worked in, but we, we need to transition like many of our peers to a problem solving model. And, and that's one kind of leader setting the mission and, and coordinating actions and, and keeping everybody in their lanes, but um, empowering people to, to deal with a certain set of problems. We, we, we are problem solvers. I mean, that is one of the best ways to describe firefighters. <clears throat> we show up to an incident that has a hazmat component a, a fire component a medical component, we would, we would just deal people out to, to handle those problems on the local level. And, uh, um, it, it's just taking that and applying it to the fire ground rather than hazmat medical and fire. Um, we're talking about fire attack rescue group and, and medical. So it, it's, it's, it's making those connections to the local level, the type five, uh, type four incidents. Yeah. You know, modern incident command to Brian's point, <clears throat> excuse me, modern incident command is a team sport. It's no longer about the individual incident commander and his or her capability and, and what's your span of control and how many resources can you personally handle. It's not That's antiquated. Um, also, it's a centralized method where all the decision-making is centralized to the incident commander, all accountability. Um, communication. Communication. And so they're relying on a radio frequency that gets overloaded. We all know there's way too much radio traffic on our frequencies. Um, maybe the incident commander on their behalf assigns an accountability officer, but that accountability officer is still orbiting the incident command post. They go out, collect uh, passports, for example, then come back, or a safety officer who, who does a lap and comes back. That's all centralized, bringing it back to the IC. We want, it, we want the incident out in front of us. We want to get ahead of it. And tactical supervisors are the answer to that. So a division or group supervisor bridges the tactical gap. They can see where the crews actually are in real time. That's active accountability. Uh, they can make tactical decisions. They're empowered and entrusted through the incident commander and through training mm -hmm. before the event ever happens as a team to say, look, I expect you on this types of fires, on a commercial, on a multi-story, on a house, uh, with a known rescue, whatever. These scenarios, let's play them out. Let's train on them so that we're on the same page. So when we execute, there's minimal communication, mm -hmm. maximum trust, and this decentralized uh, philosophy is very powerful. This is what officers want. Your company officers want to be empowered. They don't just want to be glorified clipboard holders at AMS calls. Um, they don't want to just be told what to do all the time. It, 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 it paralyzes and atrophies their decision-making muscles when they're told what to do all the time. Yeah. And we don't want that. We want initiative. But we want initiative uh, that's, that's trained, initiative that is developed. And once it's empowered and unleashed, amazing things happen. We get ahead of the curve. Yeah. For example, I had a car wash fire um, way back in 2005. I was, a, I was a relatively new battalion chief. And this was in the middle of the night. It had a head start on us. The sprinkler system, ironically, was shut down for maintenance. This wasn't arson. It was just one of those weird things. 
Um, we get there and the attic's blowing through this thing and it's got lightweight construction and it's a big car wash uh, facility. And we're, we're in an offensive strategy for a while. And after a while, you know, obviously there's no one in there. We've done primaries and secondaries, we're all clear. And this thing is not getting better. And I'm ready to pull the pin and go, we're gonna go defensive. And I had a tactical supervisor who came back to me on the radio. He said, no, there's command. We have a firewall in here. I think we can make a stand. I think we can save the majority of the building if we support this firewall. We're not gonna go beyond the firewall, we're safe. And if we hold it here, I think we can save a lot of this building. And I trusted him. Yeah, I knew his experience, I knew his training, I knew he knew what he was doing. And I said, okay. And that's, that was the first time I ever employed what's, what we talk about in the book as a combination strategy, where you have part of the building you're gonna write off, but the other half you're gonna save, like a, like a commercial building or a strip mall where you let the, the center unit go, but you save the exposure units. It was amazing. I've got video of that fire and pictures that are in the book yep. of him coming out, looking at what he has, going back in, and you see this, this stream, a two and a half shooting out the building, but at the same time, next to that are elevated master streams going into the building. Yeah. And there was a defensive space and an offensive space, therefore an overall combination strategy. And that kind of experience, those kinds of case studies are in this book. And that's what forms your knowledge of the fire ground and, and how you can save not only more lives, but also more property. Instead of just writing everything off, you actually have an opportunity if you do it right to maybe save more than you think you can. So in that fire, we saved the whole mechanical end of the car wash. We saved the smog shop that was uh, adjacent to it, attached to it, and the offices above. And... I was ready to let that all burn to the ground. Yeah. And they rebuilt that business within a few months. And, and all of a sudden, you know, we're looking at it going, wow, wow, this makes a difference. So it's a prime example of that. You know, I was, I was exposed to it uh, recently by a, a, a friend of mine who returned from a deployment with the Marines. And he said that, you know, the, the, the command mantra of the Marines right now is uh, top down planning, bottom up refinement, you know, and, that, and that's exactly like you're, you're, you're setting the, you're setting the goals here. You're, you're setting the strategy. But he communicated right back to you uh, what what you would assign him as a division and group supervisor. We would want to assign uh, someone to that position. I'm going to have you assume this, and and we're going to give you the bro, the boundaries, resources, and, and objectives. The, yep. This is where we want you to work. Here's the companies we want you to work with, and these are the objectives we want yep. you to accomplish. And uh, to to see that communicated uh, up yep. is, is amazing because yep. uh, he he clarified that for you. Hey, this is what I'm seeing at yep. the local level. Um, here's where I will operate, not beyond that. Yeah. Um, here's, here's the tools that we're, we're do, you're working with and, and here's what I believe I can accomplish from here. Yeah. And, and you too, um, met in that tactical space to agree with that yeah. and, and you supported it. And, yep. um, we know we, we, we speak to it in, in my class and yours, like you should be constantly reviewing, uh, revising or reinforcing what's going on. Yeah. And, and, and it's just, uh, it, it's great to see that at going both ways because yeah. it, it, it it demonstrates that that team sport so yeah yeah exactly and, and mission command in our article this month we talk about oh hi Look chief Rhodes, ladies chief and David gentlemen Rhodes, ladies and gentlemen big there daddy hi how you doing hi. boss hi hi what, be louder 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 like this more oh. intensity <laughs> okay this is not a georgia football game chief this is fdic go dogs <laughs> it is great. It's always been great, sir. Thank you. So the, the mission command model is a high trust state. It's about empowering your, your uh, tactical leaders. It's about training them um, and decentralized decision making and leaders intent. Hey, what's the priority? What's the strategy? What are our objectives? And then you get out of the way and let them execute. And then they might adjust it. They might tweak it. But you don't have to know every little thing that's going on. You don't. It's 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 quite. It's pretty awesome when you watch firefighters execute. When you watch your officers, as an incident commander, I can tell you, it's amazing when you see them exceed your expectations. They lean into the fray. They're getting into the battle. They love it. They're fired up about it, and they want more. It's awesome. Yeah. And you watch them grow before your eyes. But it all starts with that that boss, that that battalion chief or district chief that's training their officers. You cannot expect your training division, you cannot expect your training division to train everybody, especially your own officers, to the level you need them to be to where you can entrust them with these huge tactical decisions. I can tell you from, from that, from, from many years of this, that no fire department, whether it's across the country or our, my own fire department, 
No fire department has a robust enough training division to handle all of the work that needs to be done in a fire department. And nobody is going to replace the level of trust that you can build with your officers as a chief officer with your company officers. You have to build that trust through training with them. Execution, refinement, review, and execution and training and doing it again. That's only going to happen at that battalion level, at that district chief level. And so that level of trust is what you have to have if you expect this to work. Because um, a couple things will happen if you don't. Yeah. One, you put the wrong person in the wrong place and it folds like a cheap tent and like a house of cards. Or somebody pulls up, you know, you know what? That person would not do a good job as division supervisor yeah. or group soup. I'm going to have them, you know, on a hose line. And that paralyzes your options. As, a, as, a, as an incident commander, your, your options are paralyzed when you don't have an array of excellent tactical officers to choose from as they arrive. You don't know what arrival sequence they may come in. And you don't want to have to wait to execute properly yeah. because you haven't trained your people. So it's, I, you know, I, and I kind of highlighted it in the class yesterday and you were, uh, you were witness to that. Um, I, I want to speak or maybe have you talk a little bit about it because it even came up in your class. One of the guys uh, saying, you know, this is what I want from this course. And th this is what I want from my organization. I, I yeah. want to be able to do my job. Yeah, and, right, and, and, right. and I, I think he said, it's like, I, I just want people to leave me alone. And like, well, in, in order for you to get that trust, you have to extend it the other way. Yeah. Um, and I, so I want to talk a little bit about mission command and this, this idea, because I, I spent a lot of years in a mother may I system and yeah. in a very command centralized command system where um, you, you didn't do anything until you were told, yeah. but, it, but it was just, it was just the way we worked, you yeah. know, and, and uh, there was a lot a heavy on communication because of that. Yeah. Are, are yeah. you know, the expectations, SOPs, all those are, are proactive communication tools. This is what we expect. This is what we want to see. Now you just have to speak to the variables. And that's kind of where Mission Command is. But uh, I, I think a lot of our audience, definitely both of those classes, you could see the light switches going off for yeah. people that they're like, man, I am in a very commanding and controlling <laughs> yeah. environment. Yeah. And, and I, I am a part of it. And I yeah. may even be contributing to this problem. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we work our way out of it? Because like you said, it, it's not just a training division. It's not just a fire chief who brings this concept. It, it needs to come from those company officers of, hey, this, this is what I'm reading in Jocko Willink. This is what I'm seeing in these places. This yeah. is what I'm understanding yeah. on the fire ground. And this is what I want from you. How do we work together on this? Yeah. So you want to talk about uh, bringing that cultural shift to an organization? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard. It won't be easy because we have we have hundreds of years of tradition, unimpeded by progress, fighting against this model. A lot of a lot of uh, seasoned officers, a lot of seasoned chiefs, have a hard time with releasing that trust and releasing that decision making and decentralizing because to them they're losing control. Yeah, and that's exactly what we want them yeah, to do is yeah. lose. You don't have control. It's an illusion. It's never been real. It's an illusion. Okay, <laughs> the control is not real it's an illusion of actual control you you have can you have command and coordination yep. in other words you're saying look i'm gonna i'm gonna be the orchestra conductor but i need you to play the winds i need you to play the strings i need you to play the percussion and i'm not going to try and run around and do it all for you yeah so radio traffic goes down because those tactical supervisors are empowered to speak face to face and the incident commander doesn't need to know what's going on the incident commander needs to know that the, that the objectives have been completed or not, and do we need more resources to do it or not, and, and those benchmarks. But that comes over time. You don't develop that level of trust over time. We have a saying in the book and in our classes that training plus time equals trust. You have to have training and time, and, and you, can't have, you can't shortcut either one of them. It doesn't happen overnight, and it can't happen by osmosis. It has to happen because you're putting a lot of effort into it. And so it's an evolution. And a lot of company officers, to Brian's point, have only known that, hey, wait to be told what to do. Stage and wait to be told what to do. Or um, I'll tell you what to do when you get on scene. And it paralyzes the fire ground because there's this choke point called the incident commander or the command post that, uh, that prevents companies from executing and getting into the fray much quicker. So Brian mentioned Jocko Willing. <laughs> the military is doing this, and they have been for a long time. We have to follow in suit. Jocko Willing's book... Um, extreme ownership, one of the key components is decentralized command. He, he says, look, I can't be effective unless I entrust my other officers who are up in the fray, in the battle, to execute, uh, hold people accountable, make things happen, and get back to me what they need. 
Otherwise, the centralized model just slows things down. The problem is the centralized model has been around since Napoleon. Yeah, and we that, talked about that. that. We've that's talked about so that. Wild. Yeah, we're talking three hundred years of this. Practice. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And that's and if you watch the Napoleon movie, you see that he from from being you know the the uh, very successful as a battlefield commander uh, in a short order within what twenty years. Yeah, we yeah, had one career. Yeah, with one within one career, he became obsolete and was defeated because he wouldn't let go of the power. Okay, and that's that's what it's about. Now the good thing is that I think we're past the season. Where um, there was there was a lot of uh, resistance to this in the American Fire Service, everyone's hungry for this now. I remember yeah. 20 years ago when I was bringing this to the fire department, yeah. everyone was I thought I was crazy, which they weren't wrong. Okay, but they're like, "What the hell are you doing? I have to know what's going on." I'm not, you know, captains need to be in charge of their crew. It was just pushback after yeah. pushback, and now everyone realizes this works. Everyone wants to be empowered. Everyone's more intelligently educated about fire ground information at UL FSRI has given us more data firefighter yeah. rescue survey project made it we have more information it's being shared before it used to be it used to be hoarded the information yeah. was hoarded now everyone has great information and they want to use it and they want to be empowered and so why not train them to do it it's amazing when it happens so um but it's not going to happen overnight and it won't happen by happenstance or by by uh hope Hope is not a strategy. Yeah. Um, it's going to happen through hard work and planning and time. So, and uh, you know, you're you're speaking of something that I absolutely highlight in our in my program, and I know you do in in yours, and it is in the book. Is the the quality of our human resources is higher than ever. You yeah. know, and I I mean, I, I I'll be honest with you, like we we have the best hose and nozzle complement that that we've ever had. Uh, details of supply and and. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the fire service equipment wise is that has just outstanding equipment nowadays. Um, but the same thing has happened in our human resources. Yeah. We, we yeah. have, um, you know, th there is, there is dismissiveness about the younger generation, but, and they are smarter, sharper. Not the and fire exposed. service. Yeah, it, no. it is, it is, it is crazy. So, no, not the fire um, service. you know, to, to fail to use those human resources and in, in the education and the professional de development of our folks today um, it would be the same as leaving a tool in a compartment, you know, like yes. it, we, we yes. need to leverage them. And, yes. and it's very important. And that that is what we learned from uh, Napoleon is that he, he developed these incredible tactical supervisors. His mindset put these people in these situations. He was extremely successful battlefield commander, but he he just. It, it, he had to be the one who was he had to be the guy, the, the guy. He always had um, to be the guy and all those people around him. His human resources were at a higher level than any other, um, you know, army at the time. And he, he just didn't transition. That he didn't authority. unleash him. Yeah. And, he didn't and let him run it. Our, our, I will tell you, I mean, our, our company officers today um, in any department are, uh, they may not have the same experience, but, but uh, overall human resource quality is, is higher than it ever has been. It is. Uh, and as an example, my, we're talking, I'm thinking of Corley Moore. Okay, Corley is, is cut the fire, the weekly scrap. You know, firehouse vigilance. He's got this army yeah. of vigilantes going on. And and how is he able to do that? He's able to do it because he's smart, he's motivated, he's inspired, and he has technology and he's using it to his advantage to get his message leveraging. Out. He's yeah. leveraging it. He's writing books with his wife. He's doing amazing things. And this is just one guy out there <laughs> yeah. who's who who, you know, you look at FDIC, we're surrounded by these nitwits. There's amazing <laughs> people all around us, and they're not gonna be held back anymore. They're not yeah. gonna be held back. Technology gives them the platform. Their passions yeah. are just wearing out the old guys. Pro provide and them a path. And give them a path. Yeah. Give them a platform. That's what FDIC is so great about and fire engineering is so great about. So if you want to write a book, look at us. We're idiots. <laughs> We're morons. If you want to write a book, if you want to write an article, reach out to us. We're both on the advisory yeah. board. We want to help you like we've been helped. We've been blessed by amazing mentors and opportunities. Brian mentioned Bobby Halton. Bobby Halton championed this book from the beginning. He said it has to be a textbook. It has to be FESHI certified, a whole bit. And he set like, the objectives. He set, he set, he set the in leader's intent. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, and, and David Rhodes and and Diane and the whole team here, Star Friends, everybody uh, has done an amazing job bringing this to fruition, getting it over the finish line, especially with the deadline FDIC coming. So it's been awesome. We're surrounded by amazing people who share the vision about saving lives and serving the public and and, and just making it awesome. And 
when you're surrounded by people like this at FDIC, 32, 34,000 of us, you can't help but leave going, just going, this is amazing. I love what I do. I've got five more years left in yeah. me. I'm going to just keep going or whatever. And it's, it's the best thing in the world. So why not empower, take all that energy and empower your officers to help you run the fire? Yeah. Don't just relegate them to a nozzle and wait to be told what to do or throw a ladder and micromanage them. I, I, we're in a season now where I think a lot of the com incident commanders of today are, are students of, of our training, are students of a decentralized model. They're fired up. They want to execute. They want training. They're hungry for it. They're able to think new and out of the box. They're taking in this data that's coming at them from all over the place. And they're, they're wanting to execute it and use it. And they are. And they're doing a great job. They just need really good training, which is what we're providing. So, yeah. I mean, even to, you know, we speak to the extreme ownership book. I'd, I'd say the vast majority of, of our firefighters who have read that book or, or listened to this podcast or um, just even watched his YouTube videos, I mean, I, that is on their own fruition. Like, yeah. they, like it, it, it's very rare that a fire department says this is a book you're going to read. You know, but they're, they're seeking this information yeah. out, these concepts. It just demonstrates that that people are drawn to this mentality. And, yeah. and it goes beyond the fire ground. It goes to, like you're saying, let these company officers conduct and run training for yeah. you guys. Because yeah. uh, the more you observe them uh, interacting with other officers and setting up objectives, even in training, that's why I make a big push to align our company officer expectations with instructor expectations. You yeah. know, so yeah. um, because that... It, you know, we, the the joke is uh, you retain 90% of what you teach. So if we get them in good practices and yes. training, they are uh, institutionalizing those yeah. concepts uh, into their practices as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, we're all we're all <clears throat> blessed to be part of the fire service, right? We all are. And I can't I can't really uh, imagine any other calling for my own life. Um, looking at these nitwits walking by, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they got the swag. They got their hats, they got their jackets, their job shirts, their badges. There's a lot of pride in that. It's a yeah. lot of pride. You're not yeah. going to go to an accounting conference, you know, where there's yeah. 32,000 accountants walking around with accounting swag. <laughs> Come on. Um, and so we've both been very blessed to have these luminaries. I was, I was fortunate. One of my early mentors was Alan Brunacini. And I, with this book wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be here yeah. without Bruno. Um, Bobby Halton, obviously David Rhodes and the team now. But uh, um, it's, it's, yeah, and, and John Norman. I mean, we, uh, we asked John Norman to write the forward for us, and he graciously accepted. It was, it's wonderful. Um, and then right after Chief Norman is uh, the first uh, wisdom of the master's uh, section of the book is from Joe Castro from L.A. City. So now you have two luminaries, one yeah. from FDNY on the East Coast, one from Los Angeles City on the West Coast, both coming to you one and two punch out of this book talking about incident command from core their principles, perspective, core yeah. principles. And, and then it just goes from there. <clears throat> and then I also, I also want to talk about my friend here because uh, <laughs> that's also a divine intervention. Uh, Brian and I had made contact many years ago when he was working on his master's program um, and, and before that. And so when I saw his article come out three or four years ago mm -hmm. now um, on firefighter rescue survey on the data, I was blown away. And I went, oh, my God, this is what I've been looking for. I need this information. I need this, this data to support what my experience has been telling me. And I called up. I looked him up, and I went, oh, he's in my phone already. <laughs> I, go, I know this guy. And so I called him. He goes, hey, Chief. And I go, oh, crap. I go, oops. And then all of a sudden we hit it off. And, again, we're both men of faith. We both yeah. believe God has a plan. We both believe that, that this mission is not just to save lives but to, to help everyone uh, in their in their mission field, which is to serve others and save lives in this in this business, and so that's not accidental that we came together, and we just are thankful to have this platform. We're thankful for Fire Engineering to give it to us, um, the current team and and our, their predecessors and those like Bobby and Bruno and and people like Chief Norman and others who have just blessed us with their their time and their trust, and we want to do that for you. We want to do that for you. So. If you see us at the show, if you if you uh, see us around the country teaching, um, reach out to us. We want to help you. We want to give you what was given to us. Yeah. Right? We want to we want to pay it forward, so to speak. So um, you can reach me at info at trainfirefighters.com. My website is trainfirefighters.com. If you want training, we can come to you. We'll come to you with hands-on, dynamic incident command training. We're, we have online training to augment that. Um, but it's not just about that. It's about a conversation. It's about a coin. It's about having sharing uh, 
sharing with each other what we've been through. For example, yesterday, I had an incident commander, uh, a chief that was in the class, and he shared with me that he had a similar fire. He had a fire many years ago where three kids died, and that impacted him heavily to this day. And so he saw that this was born, this whole enterprise of Calm the Chaos was born out of that triple fatal fire we had. And he said, thank you for, for doing this because I know I know what you've been through. I know how hard it is. And, we, and I gave him a coin because you know what? That, that's a brother I just made. I just made a brother and I found another brother. And they're, and they're we're everywhere, brothers and sisters, all over this wonderful conference, all over the country, all over the world. Yeah. And that's the beauty of, of some of our online uh, ambassadors, yeah. you know, like Corley and others who are bringing the whole world together and with the passion of the fire service. So please reach out to us um, because we want to, we want to give you what was given to us by all these luminaries in our careers. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we need to share our struggles as much as we share our successes. And uh, you know, we, I know from an outside perspective, people certainly see, well, these guys are teaching at FDIC. They're writing books. They, they, uh, you know, are writing articles. They have all the answers. It's, they're incredibly it's, good looking, it, it, handsome. Yeah. They're amazing. It's, it's, it's mainly because we've been through so many problems and challenges. And that, you know, when we, when Chief Castro shares his calm the chaos, it is, it is, it is out of his experience in, in changing an organization and, and changing uh, command mindsets. And as I said, it's, it's been a five year process for me, but our, our system has also mirrored that. And, and we've, we've found points of leverage of, of promotional practices and, and SOPs and SOGs that I, I would not have identified before um, without coming into contact with you. And I, I think, you know, while this book is, is great, um, it, it is just one piece of the triangle, yeah. you know, like it, it, it yeah. is, it is a great tool. It, it helps uh, go deep on a lot of different topics, but, um, just as if you were to go to the gym and get with a, a personal trainer and they say, Hey, you need to work out more and eat less. Um, you still have to do the actual work. So, um, understand that, that this is just one part of it. And, and, and chief Castro's, a lot of his program was born out of promotional processes. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it, it's, People would be like, well, why the incident command book now and the promotional stuff before? It's because you have a mindset for, for preparation. Yeah, and and, yeah. and 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 it it does start with that initial expectations, yeah. those performances, and and people heavily invest their own personal time in professional development for promotional processes. Yeah. Yeah. After that, it's on me as the training chief to develop people and 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 provide the training. But that that initial heavy personal investment is is a powerful tool. Yeah. And I, I would not I would not steer people away from the mastering the assessment center, those other, other, uh, you know, assets that you have, because that, that does very much support and, and guide people to this. And while your organization may not be adopting this, you personally can bring practices into your life that are going to be successful. Yeah. That mean, thank you, brother. That means a lot, you know, <clears throat> mastering, the, mastering the fire service assessment center, um, first of all, you'll notice my books and videos always have mastering. It's not master because you don't ever get there. It's a process. Uh, it takes a career and a lifetime. You're never there. I was training to my last shift as a BC. Um, so it's a process. But the assessment center class um, came together organically in the sense that there was nothing else out there. I found what worked for me worked for others. And the book was first published, the first edition of Mash and the Fire Service Assessments that was published in 2006. Alan Brunicini wrote the forward, which was an incredible honor. Um, that was, again, a, a shot in the arm saying, hey, I, I believe in you, kid. You know, I think what you're doing is good. Hmm. Um, he was a, a huge mentor and dear friend. Um, but it was, it was, like Brian said, it was about officer development in the, in the incipient phase of your career. And as the years went by and I went through the ranks, um, we realized that this book, uh, the assessment center book, was really a framework for officer development of, at all levels. It was a seed. It was a seed. Mm -hmm. And so whether it was the leadership dimension or the management dimension or the emergency operations dimension, all these knowledge, skills, and abilities that are underneath, underneath those, those primary headings um, were needed across the country. So I found myself teaching command classes because students came to the class to promote, and then they, when they promoted, they wanted it to come to their fire department. Yeah not for promotion, but for officer development in the sense that how do we command fires? And then there was that for leadership. Well, they now became leaders in the organization. They moved from a, a company level to an organizational yeah. level. And I yeah. think that we've, we've talked about that people who've been brought up in the mastering the assessment center are now they're fire leading chiefs. organizations they're and fire they're chiefs, implementing yeah. Yeah, yeah. the practices. Yeah. And I think it's just, it's, 
it's a tremendous value in that that side. So. It, it's amazing. You know, uh, the fire chief of LA City, Kristen Crowley, we're doing a major project with them. She took our assessment center class of 2007 for Captain One, and she's yeah. and it's amazing to watch. Um, Janine Nicholson, the fire chief of San Francisco, she she took our class for lieutenant for San Francisco. Now she's the fire chief. We've done work with her. Um, it's amazing to watch all these chief officers who've come up through the system. Yeah. Um, and because because here's the thing. One of the antiquated theories and myths back when I was coming up, at least, and probably you heard it too, was, hey, if you want to promote, here's what you need to pass the test. Yeah. But then once you get the job, here's what you need to be good at the job. And I thought that was the stupidest thing I ever yeah. heard. Yeah. I thought to myself, what, what did you tell an airline pilot to do that? Here's what you need to do to get your pilot's license. Forget all that. Once you're in the cockpit with Just two souls, you yeah. you'll, you'll figure it out as you go. <laughs> That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. And I thought to myself, so you're telling me that if I'm a flight attendant and I've been a flight attendant for 10 years, I've been on a lot of flights, I'm qualified to fly the plane, I'll figure it out. It's basically yeah. what you're saying, it's what you're telling me. And that's what we do in the fire service. I'm like, this is stupid. Yeah. This is ridiculous. So the curriculum in, in the assessment center class and training and book was about officer core, core uh, principles and skills, how to develop them, how to have a plan, and they transition into the job. My first day as a battalion chief, I was an acting battalion chief in 2005. It was 4th of July. It was a red flag day in Sacramento, California, and I had 14 working fires. I had grass fires. I had structure fires. I had grass fires into structure fires. I had structure fires that became grass fires. It was 14, 14 calls my first day, and I was by myself, no driver, no field incident technician, none of that. And I relied on my training. I relied on everything I learned, not... Not for the test, but for the job. Yeah. And that's really what I think has, has kind of spawned all of these years later, this book. Yeah. And thanks to you reaching out and convincing my wife. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia, my, my adorable, wonderful, awesome bride of 21 years. Um, thank you to her. Thank you to our amazing daughters, Sophia and Aubrey. Um, and you too. I mean, yeah. you're, you got to call them out, brother. Call out your wife <laughs> yeah. and your kids. Well, I mean, they, they're, they're getting ready to go to school right now. So so Sarah is, is at home uh, running the house. And um, she has forever, you know, back to me being on shift. And uh, uh, it's it's that mission mindset. You know, it's like she she knows that this is my passion. She knows that uh, that is it is a very important part of my life to, to share my message and our message and and, and be here in, in an area to do that. And, uh, and she takes on those, those extra duties at home to, to support that, you know, and, and back to when I was, when I was a fireman and, and working the shifts and I would come home so that she could go uh, work in the NICU, you know? And so, and I, I would support yeah. the children at home. I mean, it, it is, all this stuff is, is a team, team, effort. team effort. Team so, sport. so Sarah, Keegan, Lila, and Luke, uh, you know, have a great day. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm excited for, for all that uh, we get to, be a part of together and yeah and and then i also get to to have this as an experience as well so yeah um it's it's great man i i, I could not be more excited about how this week is already shaping up yeah. um the yeah. the the great experience that we had yesterday was with so many people yeah. and, and the, all over the country the, all, the more, all exposure to i mean it's just it like you said it is it is a needed it is a needed topic and and, and yeah. we have a lot of people who um have been following this career path and it's it's like um, I think back to just a few years ago, the initial uh, uh, fire stream studies, the ventilation studies from UL. Those those yeah. are all things that people came up through their career and they're like, oh, well, this is new information. This is great information. This is awesome. This is new information. This is great information. This is awesome. And they all are at the tactical level. You know, the 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 ventilation, yeah. the the fire streams, the search, these these studies that have been coming out. Um that's been over the course of people's career. And now they're promoting the chief officer and battalion chief. And they're saying, where is that information um, that I've now become accustomed to that evidence-based practices at the task and tactical level, where is that for command? And I feel like we are now right providing there. that. And, and it is, I mean, the, the firefighter rescue survey, the UL information, it has that task and tactical component to it of victims should be removed at this level. You know, they should be uh, compartmentalized. Ben and her search has this. But then at the strategic level, we're starting to incorporate, if you're going to a working fire with victims trapped in an apartment building, you need to be anticipating an MCI. We have to move you from the what's happening right now to the the if this, then that, uh, the next level. And uh, I I think that that's what people are being drawn to it now is, is, oh, is yeah. those things that they've yeah. been 
comfortable with and, and noticing that ventilation curve looks just like the incident power curve. Yep, the, yep. We, we speak to nozzle and hose work in here and, and how at the task level we can coordinate operations to support life. Um, and I, um, I'm very excited about how it came together. I can't wait for people to start discovering the content, yeah, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. And it's, and we, we introduced a lot of new stuff in here. There's a lot of new concepts that we've, that, that we've created that out of experience and training over the years, um, breach enter search, you know, you can't do VES much higher than a third floor of that. Uh, what do you do above that? Breach enter search works. Uh, we've got a case study in, in the book about it. Um, what I call pincer search or where you've got multiple victims with, without their known locations or a victim without known location, but you know you have a victim, but where are they? So going in from multiple locations and controlling the flow path while doing so and attacking the fire. There's a lot of stuff in here, uh, tactically speaking. So we're wrapping up. Just want to thank you for your time. Who, If you're watching this, um, thank you for everyone who's buying the book. Um, thank you to uh, you know John Norman, Joe Castro, Bobby Halton, David Rhodes, Diane, Diane Rothschild, uh, Star Franz, and and Tony Quinn. Um, thank you to our families. Yeah. And thank you to God. Thank you, God, for the blessings of of this career, our families, this friendship, this brotherhood, um, and this this book that we hope and know will save lives. So yeah. um, thanks, everybody. Again, if you need to reach me, info at trainfirefighters.com. Go to our website, trainfirefighters.com. We'll come to you and do some phenomenal hands-on, multi-company, smoke machines, pulling hose lines, SCBAs, incident command training in the field. That's the next level. Simulations are great, but they're not enough anymore. So let me know if you uh, want us to come out. And then I just want to close with uh, with uh, the fire engineering side of this. Um, and uh, and I, I would not be in the position that I am without the support of, of fire engineering for, yeah. for for well over 10, I mean, now we're going on 20 years that I've been a part of the fire engineering family. And, uh, and I, I, I want you all to know that uh, fire engineering is, a, is the leader in training. It is the, the leader in, in providing these resources from hot classes to textbooks. Um, I'm very proud to represent the fire engineering family. I'm, I'm very proud to have my name associated with, with fire engineering books, with the videos, with FDIC, um, all these aspects of it. And, and I, I want to be a better and ambassador of fire engineering and, and the work that this team is doing. And, and I'm, I look forward to a bright future with fire engineering. So um, please uh, also associate us with our relationship with fire engineering and Absolutely. FDIC and, 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 and know that you can access through any us through any of their platforms. Yeah, so. yeah please do. Um, I, I look back and um, I mean, my keynote, your keynote was a year ago. Mine was 11 years ago. <laughs> um, don't think you can't to give a keynote someday. Don't think you can't write an article. You can write an article. You can come and teach at FDIC. You might write a book one day. Don't limit yourself. Fire engineering, the family is, is a big family and we love when the family grows. So please reach out to either one of us. Yeah. Um, we're always looking for good authors or good, uh, good classes. We're always reviewing classes for F every FDIC as the years come and go. So please don't limit yourself. If you, oh, I'm just a volunteer. I'm just in one station department. No, you're not just anything. You, you matter and you care and you have experience. And if you have a passion and your message is sound, it's needed, it's going to get, it's going to get amplified through this. So thanks for watching. Yeah. I appreciate you. Thank you. Firehouse subs as well. <laughs>